Wendy Spencer is somebody who uh, I've come to know over the last uh, year or two as a remarkable leader. She is a member of the Obama administration. She runs the Corporation for National and Community Service, under whose umbrella exists uh, entities that you've heard of, like AmeriCorps, Senior Corps, VISTA. Yeah, there, there are, I think, volunteers in all those organizations in this room. And, but that too, the Corporation for National and Community Service is both a mouthful and it sounds like a big bureaucracy. What Wendy Spencer does every day is to evangelize service. What she does every day is to tell the story, sometimes in audiences like this, sometimes in cabinet meetings and closed door uh, meetings uh, in, in, in halls of power in Washington, D.C., about why service matters and what service is. And so we're going to hear in a moment from Wendy Spencer, the CEO of the Corporation for National Community Service. But before we do that, I think she wanted to show us a little video that helps tell the story and set the scene. Hello. Hello, fellow students of Citizen University. I feel like a student today. I've learned so much. And I hope we can all graduate. I hope. This is going to be great. I hope you enjoyed that. If you looked at those images like I do, you saw a lot of images. You saw some things that are troubling. You saw disasters. You saw despair. You saw suffering. But you also saw building, rebuilding, repair. You saw uh, people being rescued. You saw hope, I hope. You saw people of all types, from all kinds of places working together. And that's what service is. And so that's what I want to finish this day off before we're sworn again, which gives me chills to think about being sworn again. I just love that. And Eric's going to give us a real gift this afternoon, is to think about um, how we can help rescue one another. So I want to go back in time a little bit. So let's go back well over 200 years. So think about this moment in July of 1776, where delegates from 13 American colonies are about to take a very bold step. They're going to prepare to declare the independence from Great Britain. Imagine the uncertainty that they have at this moment. Imagine the fear, but also imagine the courage it took to eventually add their names to that sheet of parchment, co-signing a revolutionary idea that gave birth to a new nation. Think about that moment. About that time, Ben Franklin said, we must all hang together or assuredly, we shall all hang separately. Separately, he said. They did hang together, and Americans have been hanging out together ever since, flexing our, as Annie told us today, our civic muscle together, working to build a great nation, working together in teams. Our rights as individuals came with responsibilities as citizens. And that's what we've been talking about all day today. What are some of our responsibilities? Are we banding together, hanging out together, sacrificing for greater good? Why do we serve? Why do we serve? Everyone in this room that I've talked to today helps one another, serves in one capacity or another. I say it's in our DNA. I say it's right in our DNA. Service is written right in there. Think about it. See that? See, you didn't know that, did you? A science lesson here today. It's right in there. It's one of the components of Americans. Just think about the fact that we have a federal agency to advance service and to support local organizations with a great recipe for human capital support. At the Corporation for National and Community Service, I have the privilege to work alongside and lead, lead about 5 million Americans. Here's how we break that down. About 75,000 AmeriCorps members and VISTA members and AmeriCorps NCCC members. About 340,000 Senior Corps volunteers. We have the days of service we sponsor, 9-11 day of service, Martin Luther King day of service. About 760,000 Americans serve on those days. And in addition to that, we have volunteers who come in extemporaneously, spontaneously, episodic. Four million Americans serve alongside our AmeriCorps members and our senior corps volunteers. And I have to tell you good news. That's up a half a million over the previous year with the same number of formal participants we have. That's a good trend. We went from 3.5 million to 4 million Americans serving. We're working in 70,000 locations across America. 
70,000 locations. So what that means is just about any place I step into or out of, any door I step out, I could holler, AmeriCorps, Senior Corps, are you out there? And someone will shout back, I'm here. I'm going to give this a try. This is risky for me to do, but I'm going to give it a try. And if you're out there, when I ask you, say, I'm here. AmeriCorps, Senior Corps, are you there? They're here. Excellent. I'm batting a thousand. Whew. Good. You didn't make a liar out of me. This is great. You, thank you. You are serving either as a miracle member or you're an alum. I've met several of you today, and I just love that. You're, you're serving our country in a wonderful way in supporting local organizations. About 64 million Americans volunteered through a formal organization this past year. It's pretty amazing. 65, on top of that, 65% of our population helped one another, did favors for neighbors through less formal organizations, or not through an organization at all, but just supported people they love or care for. But you know what I've learned today? Not to take this for granted. Not to take our citizenship for granted, not to take volunteerism for granted, both from Jose and from Laura, who talked about us and their stories, that we shouldn't take this for granted. Because volunteerism, as I have grown up from a small child serving in my community in South Georgia, I know you all thought I was with this voice was from Maine. <laughs> I didn't know that I spoke differently until I moved last. The president asked me to serve in April. I was confirmed by the Senate. Thank goodness Whew, what a process that's for through. But anyway, um, I started in, in April, and I didn't know that I spoke differently until I was speaking with, Senate, uh, with um, Secretary Arne Duncan, asked me to speak with him, read some books on a Wednesday at, uh, in the summer. And afterwards, and I'll never forgive him for this, he asked 100 kindergarten and first graders if they'd like to ask us some questions. And so one little girl pointed to me, I'd like to ask that lady a question. And she said, where are you from? And I said, oh my, I said, I've just moved to Washington from Tallahassee, Florida. Let me ask you something. Do you think I speak differently? And in unison, the entire 100 children said, yes. And one little girl raised her and says, you sound like a cowgirl. <laughs> I looked at Arnie Duncan. I said, that's the last time I'm doing anything with you, Secretary Duncan. But anyway, I love being, uh, being different, I guess, from my, my voice. But, but the service that you and I know we should not take for granted in America in fact, it's actually very unique. As I meet people from other nations who come to America and want to study service and volunteerism as we know it, that comes very naturally to us, I'm learning very quickly that service in America is very unique. And it is a privilege to be able to have the freedom to volunteer and work to support one another in our, the choice organizations that we choose to join or to volunteer with. I met a man from Russia last week at the National Service Learning Conference. And he came up to me afterwards and he just could not stop asking me a lot of questions about our agency and the work that we did. He was mesmerized. He said, would you do, we had a hard time communicating with that. I said, look, don't worry. Most people in New York don't understand me. So I know you from Russia probably don't understand me. But, but he wanted me to do a webinar with him. He said, we are very interested in what is going on here in America. There were two dozen countries represented at the service learning conference. There'll be dozens of, of countries that will come to the National Conference on Volunteerism this June. We, our agency, hosted representatives from 65 countries last year who wanted to learn about this unique system of volunteerism and citizen engagement and participation that we have in America. And so quickly it's becoming clear to me that what we have is special and unique and we should not take it for granted. And I think that is, is a, a very, very important lesson. So I want to share with you just a couple of quick stories, again, about why we serve and some of the reasons we serve. So the first one is about a lady named Maureen. This was taken in November in a community called Bell Harbor, New York near Rockaway, New York, and you can imagine the time period in November. This occurred right after the superstorm of the century, so to speak, uh, Superstorm Sandy, the second most devastating storm 
uh, only second to Hurricane Katrina. Billions and billions of loss. So I was going there to visit some AmeriCorps members, and AmeriCorps and C members from Washington who had traveled to New York to serve and help the citizens there. And we, I was going in to meet these AmeriCorps members who were serving in this home that had been completely flooded out. It was a single story home, a very, a very, very modest home, but it was a home to a family, to a widow, Maureen, who was a widow of a public safety officer. And it was complete as we were mucking out, all of the contents of the house had to come out. The floor had to come out. The, the sheetrock had to be torn four feet high to replace it so that mildew and mold would not continue to grow. All of the contents, in fact, her piano had to come out. Many of the contents had to be torn up and, and broken and chopped up to put curbside so they could come and pick it up. Her daughter came up as I arrived and she said, I knew you were coming and I wanted to thank you for being here at my mother's home and helping, coming to our rescue. And my mother would like to come and thank you. And if it's okay, I'd like to go get her. She's living with us on the second floor of our home several blocks away because our home was also flooded. And my, my husband's a firefighter and he's busy and my sister is married to a police officer in New York. And we're all living together on the second floor because our bottom floor is in shambles and it also has mold and mildew. But mom would like to come meet you. So I said, that'd be great. She said, but listen, when she comes, I don't want her to see the piano sitting curbside. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna park just, just a little bit down the street and if you could come and meet her, um, I just don't want her to see the total devastation. She hasn't been back to the house yet. So she ran to get her mother, brought her up in the car. It was raining at the time. And we all, there was a group of us, and we sort of provided a sort of a human shield of the debris that she would have seen on the curbside that was all her contents of her home. And we all hugged and wept together. She was weeping of joy that we were there to help to rescue her home and her. She was so happy, and we were happy to be there to help. What a privilege it is to serve one another. So that's the story of Maureen. If you click to the next story, it's one of Mary. Now this is a very interesting story. If you know about AmeriCorps and C members, AmeriCorps and C members are members from age 18 to 24 that band together in teams of 10 or 12 and they travel around the country at, at a community's request to come and serve, build trails, rebuild homes, do tutoring projects. Whatever the need is in the community, they are trained and ready to serve. They often do disaster work. But on this particular occasion, the team went to Monmouth, uh, Illinois, and they were there sent to do some rebuilding of some homes. And in one case, this team was to be rebuild a ramp for a person who uses a wheelchair. So several days they worked rebuilding this ramp. They didn't really ask the questions about why they were rebuilding the ramp. They just did it. That's how, what AmeriCorps members do. When asked to serve, they just go in and do it. And they do it with a smile. And every day she would repay them with cream puffs, I'm told. So the, when they finished the ramp, they wheeled Mary out, or she came out, and she took a ride down her new ramp. And she just bawled and cried at the end of the ramp. And one of the miracle members said, why are you crying? This is wonderful. You know, you've got a new ramp here. And she said, you don't understand. She said, for the past eight years, I have not been able to leave my home by myself on my own accord. I've had to have assistance. Because I hired a contractor eight years ago, a private contractor, and paid for the ramp to be built. And it was built improperly. It was so steep that I couldn't control it. So I could not leave my home by myself. I had to have help doing it. And she was crying because this was the first time that she was able to leave her home. Isn't that amazing? These members helped her do that. It was just fantastic. The last story I'll share with you is about Dago. Dago is, uh, is a high school student in Denver, Colorado. And Dago's a pretty neat average kid. Um, but Dago, he loves building, uh, working on cars. But he also, unfortunately, liked to skip school. So this AmeriCorps team was brought in to help students with their attendance and their coursework and tutor and mentor children. So Dago was matched with an AmeriCorps member named Lily. 
Lily's job was to make sure that Dago succeeded in school. So she's ready on the first day of school to meet, to meet Dago, and he doesn't show up. He skips the very first day of school. She's like, oh my gosh, this is going to be trouble to work with Dago. So she calls his house, and she talks to his mother. She said, Dago didn't come to school, and mother didn't know it. She was so busted, so busted. So he comes to school the next day. Now he knows that Lily is actually told on him. So now this is really going to be tough, right? But Lily stayed and persevered in the miracle oath. You actually, it's part of it. I will persevere. But she persevered. He says, Dago, I'm going to stick with you, buddy. And my goal is that you come to school, and I'm going to, you and I are going to work together. We're going to study together, and we're going to overcome any obstacles that you have so that you can succeed. And it worked. His attendance became 100%. He passed all of his classes and went on well on his way towards graduation. All because he had a partner to help him. So Lily was his rescuer. The AmeriCorps members rescued Mary. The Washington um, State Conservation Corps AmeriCorps members helped Maureen get back in her home. Maureen's asked me to come back this spring when her home's better. And I'm going to sit on her porch with her and go back to her home. And we're going to share a lemonade. And we're going to have a good conversation about service and what it means to her and what it meant to her. So why do we serve in America? We serve because it's needed. While the economic crisis, we're starting to see recovery, thank heavens. It, there's still a lot of people suffering. And they need their Lily or their America team or their volunteers to help them connect. Our military personnel need support. Over one, one million military personnel will be coming back to America over the next five years. If you will, if you are a member of the military or former member of the military, a veteran, or have a family member currently in the, in the military or a veteran, will you please stand? If you have someone connected to you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And stay standing, if you will. If you will, just stand for a minute. You all are making sacrifices for us. And I believe it's our duty to support you with everything we can do. Whatever your needs are, as you get through, if you're a military personnel or a family member that is trying to be supportive, we need to help you too. And we can do that with programs like the Washington Vet Corps that is helping veterans who are enrolled in colleges throughout the state of Washington. We've got one here, yes. Um, this is a successful program that I talk about all over the country, but we need to help you. So I'll, I'm going to commit today that every bone in my body, everything I can do, that we will be there for you. Thank you so much for being supportive with our military families and our military. Thank you. I have great news. The high school graduation rate is actually at its highest in 30 years. It's 78%. We're making progress, folks. We're making progress because we're banding together to get behind our students. You know, I tell everyone, our students, problems in education is an adult problem. We need, as adults, to reach out and help our schools, our teachers, the fabric of our community around education. But we still have a lot of people not graduating, not successful, not seeing success in school, especially with those in low-income neighborhoods. Our Latinos, America, uh, African Americans, are falling behind, and we need to continue to persevere and help and be there for them. And service can do so, which I think is just great. So I'm happy about the fact that service as a strategy can get results. So citizenship is what we've been talking about today. We've had a great day together, uh, meeting new friends, listening to some wonderful testimonies, pontificating on different ways that we can flex our citizen muscle. And I think when it comes time that we can all do our part, whether it's voting or attending public meetings or our civic duty in some way or another, but also volunteering, sitting on boards, giving financial donations, in-kind donations, going out of our way to help someone in need, supporting our military families and our military personnel who are returning back to this state and every state in the country. And hundreds are coming back, thank goodness, and they're going to need our help. But one thing we've got to do to remind ourselves 
is that we have to ask each other to serve. And I think that that's what's important is that we ask. We talked in our table here in the corner about people don't generally wake up in the morning and say, I think I'm going to go volunteer today. They generally do so because someone's asked. So I'm going to, I'm going to test this out. You have a lovely multicolored sweater. What is your name? Ka Cecile? Cecily, and where are you from? Okay, Cecily, I'm going to come back to Seattle. I have to leave tonight, but I'm going to come back in a couple of months. And I'm going to do some volunteer work, maybe with the Washington Vet Corps or Reading Partners Program. Would you join me when I come back? Ce it worked. <laughs> Cecily is going to join because I asked her. And we have to remember to ask. And there's another lesson I want you to remember, too. We have to thank people. We have to thank people who serve. Thank people who serve in leadership roles, who volunteer, the unsung hero. People, volunteers will tell you they volunteer because they're attached to a, a cause or a need, which is true. But if you don't share a thanks or appreciation to someone who volunteers, they won't feel like their time is valued. And they will go find another, another cause if you don't share with them the reason that their help is valued and their time is valued. So all of you work probably with an organization with volunteers. So I'm going to challenge you that on Monday or tomorrow that you think about all the volunteers that you can thank on Monday. And let that be your thank you day. Don't wait for National Volunteer Week, which is coming up in April. Do it on Monday. Will you, will you meet that pledge with me? You will thank your volunteers that you're working with, please. All right, that's a great pledge for us. So in closing, I'm going to leave with a, some leaders' quotes that I think are very important. I'm, it's a privilege for me to serve in this administration, and President Obama, when he asked for me to serve, I eagerly said yes. It was very, very, it's, it's a joy and an honor. And when he was preparing for National Day of Service uh, this year for Martin Luther King Day, I love this quote he said, when you serve, you change lives, and the life you change most might be your own. How important, that, isn't that true? Might be your own. About 25 years ago, President George H.W. Bush called on our nation to serve fellow citizens. He had a thousand points of light and so many great initiatives like that. And he said, there is no definition of a successful life that does not include service to others. And I truly believe he believes that to the core, and I've talked to him about service. And then going back to Ben Franklin's word, we must all hang together, or assuredly, and say it with me, we shall all hang separately. So when I ask you this question in closing, and I hope you'll give me a resounding I will, will you all hang out with me to be a volunteer, a citizen, an American? Will you? I will. I will. Excellent. God bless all of you, and thank you for being a graduate.